Hello, everybody. Welcome. And uh, this is for May fifth, I believe. On uh, I'm it's Friday today, so just I'm recording the class. I'm heading to uh, Tokyo in the next few minutes, uh, so I'm going to be missing. Um, Saturday morning, unfortunately. So just setting this out and I've got my monkey suit on and uh, ready to go. And uh, anyway, so I just figured to record this class. I'm gonna have to do about 45 minutes or so just cause um, I have to get going, uh, head out to the airport and stuff. So I just figured to do a little meditation, tiny bit of a teaching just before um, we head out. And uh, this will be for this week. I get back to Nelson in a few days and then I have a long time off. Uh, so we'll be just finishing this course up soon and having a question and answer at the end of it and the discussion, which I'm looking forward to. Okay, so let's just everybody uh, just take a moment just to sort of get into the space here. The present moment. My dear old Dharma friend Chuck years ago had a thing where he'd say with his mom, he'd say they had a funny sort of Dharma question and answer. He'd say, what time is it? And she'd say, uh, now. Uh, and he'd go, where are we? And then she'd go, here. And then he'd go, what are we talking about? And he'd go, this. <laughs> so I've always remembered that it's quite clever. And so here we are in the present moment, right here, right now, and we're going to meditate together. So just start with the Heart Sutra here. Homage to perfection of wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Thus I've heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgri and Mass Walter's Mountain, paid assembly of monks and great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also Superior Balakrishvara, the Bodhisattva of the Great Being, was looking perfectly at the practice of profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then at the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari put your sense for Velashar, the Bodhisattva of the Great Being, how should a son of a lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spira Velashar, the Bodhisattva of the Great King, replied to Venerable Shari Putra as follows. Shari Putra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection of wisdom, should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly at also at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence, form is empty and emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, and form is not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Charipatra, like this, all phenomena are emptiness, having no characteristics. They're not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Charipatra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality. No form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile object, no phenomenon. There's no eye element and so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There's no ignorance, no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted, with, uh, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Sherpaja, because there's no attainment, body sappas rely on and abide the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing on and beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest, complete Buddhas, and state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, and surpassed mantra, the equal and equal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. Mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayata, Om Gata Gata Paragata Parasam Gadi Bodhisoha. Shari Putra Bodhisattva, a great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration of Shetsvar of Alokashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being that he'd spoken well. Good, good, son of Lynch, just like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed, in that way, the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced, and the Tathagatas will also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shari Putra, Spirit of Alokashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, and the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. I'll just recite the uh, Gate Mantra here seven times. Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha. Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha.
ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे बोधि सोहा ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे बोधि सोहा ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे बोधि सोहा ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे बोधि सोहा ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे बोधि सोहा ओके वी कैन जस्ट डू आवर नाइन पॉइंट ब्रीथिंग हियर सो थ्री ब्रेथ्स इन थ्रू द लेफ्ट एंड आउट थ्रू द राइट गेटिंग रिड ऑफ दिस आर्स अटैचमेंट बीइंग हंग अप ऑन स्टफ बीइंग अटैच थिंग्स uh three inhales through the uh, right nostril exhale through the left getting rid of anger reactivity resentment frustration so forth and three deep breaths through both nostrils and on the final inhalation holding it just the navel put your mind mix the mind the prana and your breath all just uh, around a little bit below your belly button there navel chakra and on the final exhalation we can just let go and exhale through both nostrils Okay. So let's just visualize our field through Ganesha merit. Just uh, again, just a little short because um, the uh, class today is a little short. We're just going to visualize uh, the a figure for uh, Lama Chopa practice, Lo Sentu Boy Dorja Shine. So the threefold figure of Jason Kappa, Buddha Shakyamuni, and Buddha Shakyamuni's higher Sambhuga Kaya form of Vajradhar and Vajradhatu Ishvari. So in the sky, beautiful, we're just a uh, beautiful blue sky here uh, above us. Uh, ourselves, we're surrounded by all sentient beings. Our mother on our left, father on our right, people we love the most behind us, people we like the least in front of us. And moving out concentric circles from there, human beings from all over the world, different backgrounds, countries, and so forth. Countless animal beings, a whole sort of natural environment here of the planet Earth, other dimensions too. Countless spirit beings from the spirit world. Uh, celestial beings, gods and demigods. And beings from lower states of uh, rebirth or existence, hell beings, hungry ghost beings and so forth. All of us here meditating together. And looking up in the sky like a beautiful sun in a clear blue sky. We're visualizing uh, made of pure energy or pure light. Uh, Lo Sintu Bay Dorja Chan. So uh, Jay Sankapa, it's a central figure. He's sort of floating in the sky, three robes of a monk and yellow pennant's hat in lotus position. And he's holding um, a white lotus that blossoms around his right ear in the mudra of teaching at his heart. And left hand is a mudra of meditation with a begging bowl filled with mystical nectar. And at his heart, let's visualize Buddha Shakyamuni and Buddha is how we usually visualize him. And uh, sitting in lotus position, uh, three robes of monk, golden sort of energy body, begging both nectar and meditation uh, pose here. 
mudra and is in the lap and um, right hand is in mudra, uh, subdued mudra, so touching the earth with palm open. Now at his heart is his higher symbol, Gakaya form, angelic form, conquer Vajradar and Vajradatushvari. And they're in beautiful um, sort of young people, you know, just uh, made out of blue energy, sapphire blue energy in lotus positions. Uh, Vajradar is in lotus position, they're in sexual brace. So uh, Vajradatushvari is sort of straddling him, arms around his neck. He's holding a bell in his left hand, torching his right. She's holding a skull cup in her left, chopper knife in her right. And they were wearing crowns and jewels and so forth. Very, very beautiful. So taking refuge, I and all sentient beings, to which you lame, go for refuge to put a dharma and sangha. I and all sentient beings, to which you lame, go for refuge to put a dharma and sangha. I and all sentient beings, to which you lame, go for refuge to put a dharma and sangha. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections may we become Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Okay, so generating refuge and bodhicitta in our hearts here. Now, uh, these um, four measurables, generating love, compassion, equanimity, and uh, joy. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. May no one ever be separated from their happiness. May everyone have equanimity, free from hatred and attachment. So again, from our heart, with our bodhicitta, motivation getting enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, so that all sentient beings reach full Buddhahood. We're just sort of sending out this sort of wish that all sentient beings um, find love and are loved and we love them. It's wanting them to be happy. Sentient beings have compassion. We have compassion for them that they be free of all their sufferings. That we all share in joy here. That we all sentient beings never be separated from their happiness. And for the joy of nirvana, joy of liberation joy of being free, sort of owning your own power. And uh, equanimity, may all sentient beings have equanimity, may we have equanimity too. And that's like being uh, sort of beyond the dilemma or dichotomy of uh, hope and fear, uh, sort of uh, desire and anger, all these kinds of things. Uh, attachment and reactivity or frustration instead sort of going right down the middle here where we have a warm sort of open friendly attitude towards all sentient beings it's a very very balanced grounding attitude seven in practice here Making our practice Buddhist, we prostrate in body, speech, and mind in the merit field here. We make each and every offering to all holy beings. We confess all of our negativities, sort of acknowledge, own, and work to sort of overcome them. And we rejoice in virtues of all sentient beings, particularly all the virtues and powers and goodness of all holy beings. We always ask the Buddhas and our teachers, our root in particular, to stay with us through this life and next life and so forth. And always ask them to teach us, to guide us, in particular for a root guru to guide us in sort of the place of the Buddhas here uh, by giving us personal advice, guidance, personal advice in our day to day lives. And finally, everything we do, we dedicate for the enlightenment of all sentient beings. Now offering a mandala from our hearts, purified universe, long goodness, 
The ground sprinkled with perfume, spread with flowers, the great mountain, four lands, sun and moon, seen as a Buddha land and offered thus, may all beings enjoy such pure lands. I send forth this jewel of manly to you, precious gurus. So upon making those prayers, just feel that just golden lights and nectars are now coming down for uh, from the heart of uh, sort of the heart space between Vajradhar and Vajradhar in the center figure there of Lo Sentu by Dorje Chan. And this golden, it's just like sunlight is coming down, blessing all beings around us. I'm just almost like we're all kind of glowing with sunlight here. I'm blessing some all the Buddhas here. Now let's just do the dissolution uh, meditation here. So at this point now, just we can visualize that all sort of light starts to gather forth, sort of almost getting sucked into. Uh, center of the heart uh, space of Vajradhar and Vajradhatushvari. And Jason Kappa starts to melt to light, sort of almost like golden sunlight starting to melt and dissolving inward. And he melts into his heart, into Buddha Shakyamuni. Now Buddha Shakyamuni starts to melt into golden light as well and dissolves into Vajradhar and Vajradhar I just feel that they get really, really small, about the size of a sunflower seed or so, a little jewel in the sky. And they start to drift down to us. Into the crown of her head and then start to descend. And when they reach her heart, just feel that just they melt into light, beautiful blue light that dissolves directly into her heart, right into our root mind. At this point, just have an experience of bliss and emptiness, sort of oneness. Deep, deep peace, deep, deep uh, happiness. We're just gonna do just sort of a um, sort of short Vajra recitation meditation here. So just feel just with the blessings of all our gurus and all holy beings in your hearts. Let's just um, start transforming our breath here, mixing our breath with sort of holy prana. So when we inhale, just feel that this breath is of the nature of the om syllable, O-M, which is the holy body, the enlightened body of all the Buddhas. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you can visualize it being sort of a white color if you like, but best thing, it's just the syllable om, the vibration om, mixing that vibration with your inhalation. So when you inhale, internally, just really feel that that's om. Now, at the end of that inhalation, just holding it for a moment, that is the holy um, speech of all the Buddhists, the ah syllable, H, A, H, ah. It can be a red color if you like. I'm also just holding the prana there for a minute and the breath mixed with that seed syllable. Ah. And then when we exhale, it's hum, H-U-M, which is the enlightened uh, mind of all the Buddhas. So enlightened body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas mixing with our breath. 
and purifying or sort of becoming one with our prana. So again, that can be blue uh, uh, exhalation, if you like, uh, up to you. Otherwise, again, just most important thing is mixing those vibrations, those mantras, those seed syllables with the breath. In this final little bit here, just again, inhalation for Om, holding the breath, Ah, uh, and exhalation, Om.
Okay, have you got an annotation down? So a few uh, remarks here on uh, just to get started on a discussion of uh, emptiness. So we've talked about this before in um, other classes I've uh, posted up <clears throat> on this. So this is just going to be just sort of the introductory part of it. I'll be able to do a little bit more next week, uh, for instance. <clears throat> Okay, emptiness. Um, I got a definition. I mean, again, this I, I'm talking about this um, a bunch of different classes. It's not exhaustive, or it's just you know just little remarks here and there. Class after class, we're getting sort of a better understanding of what it is. Uh, okay, so this will be a little bit just because I have to make a shorter class here, a little bit of a shorter presentation of it. Again, we'll come back to it again next week and in future classes as well. So emptiness, self-existence that doesn't exist anyway is what emptiness is empty of. So of course, um, the um, uh, Tompanisa, the um, Tibetan word for emptiness, uh, shunyata in Sanskrit. So that's the, uh, the English word we're using is emptiness. So sometimes it's capitalized there. And um, there's always an issue, I've spoken about this before with translation a little bit. I'm, uh, the older Dharma books, should we get anything from the 1970s or 80s, oftentimes they use the word voidness, which um, sounds kind of daunting and very sort of heavy word voidness, right? Um, uh, the problem I think a lot of times is even just with um, English. English is a very nominative language. It's a language of names. Other languages are languages that really bespeak sort of feelings like the romantic languages, for instance, or processes, maybe like Chinese. Um, you know, English is a mix of a whole bunch of different languages, you know, Anglo-Saxon, uh, uh, Gaelic, French, so forth. So yeah, I would say that, you know, because of the French influence from the Norman invasion after uh, 1066, you get a lot of words that are um, doubled in English because you've got the French word that's coming in English as well as the local sort of more Germanic root uh, word that you have traditionally in English, like Anglo-Saxon word or even sort of Gaelic or Celtic word or whatever. So, you know, famous like mouton, uh, mutton, you know, for instance, being the French word and sheep this kind of thing, you've got a bunch of different words. So I think the problem you get a lot is when we use the, the term emptiness, you think that it's a thing, right? Of course, with voidness, like void is a thing. So oftentimes there can be a little bit of a confusion. What does this mean? In French, it's vacuité, which really means sort of an absence, like a vacuum. Um, it, and sometimes I think probably other languages might be a little bit better at expressing this, right? Um, so anyway, basically it's, when we say emptiness, emptiness is empty of something. It's almost like there's a logical connection there. It's empty of something. So what is it empty of? Well, it's empty of self-existence. Uh, Alexander Burson calls it impossible existence, which I like the idea that there is a self or sort of a principle or existence that is unrelated to anything else, you know, so unrelated existence, I guess you could see you guys as sort of clunky way of putting it. So emptiness is, is that things are empty of that. In other words, they don't have that. So that's why a lot of times when we say emptiness, we also call it as an object of negation in the sense that it's an object or a thing that we're denying or refuting, uh, saying that it's not there. So uh, basically, you know, the, what is that? What is not there? Well, it's self-existence, again, sort of impossible existence, or the fact that you have all bunch of qualities of a thing, you know, its color, shape, its size, its weight, or whatever. And then there's something that our mind in a diluted way adds on to that, which is a quality that this thing must be unrelated to everything else that exists in and of its own power with no causal relationship, logical relationship, psychological relation, any kind of relationship to anything else. So it's that thing is not there when we say that something is empty. So that one sort of principle of the thing, so to speak, that one quality of the thing is not there and it's never been there. When we look for it, it's never been there. It's something that's been kind of added on later, so to speak, by our mind that then retroactively says it's always already been there but it's all, always already not been there, right? So that's when we talk about emptiness, what we really mean. So it's an object of negation. Now there's four schools of emptiness. I mentioned we'll talk about that, that in Tibetan Buddhism, they really sort of group when you're studying for your Kampo or Geshe degree, 
uh, you've got hundreds of years of scholarship in India on different um, teachings of the Buddha around emptiness. And so, and even through time, different ones get more popular or whatever. So they, but in, when we come to Tibetan Buddhism, they've sort of taken all these sort of India, classic Indian texts and traditions. And then out of that isolate that there's four major uh, systems of, of presentation of emptiness. And we'll get to it later how we basically, they're dialectical, basically the ones that are a little bit more introductory or coarse, or I don't wanna say superficial, but a little bit more easy to understand, end up self-destructing, so to speak. And in their self-destruction or in their limitation or, or their horizon, so to speak, they show, they sort of logically show the system that supersedes them, that ends up correcting them, that subsumes them, that builds on them. So you sort of, this is, you know, Hegel, the famous German philosopher calls Alphabung, which means uh, surpassing yet transcending yet, yet uh, preserving, right? So the good parts of each school is preserved in the next, but at the same time, they're superseded or further developed on or corrected. Right. So the first one being the Vibhashika school, which is often called the Abhidharma school, then the Sutric school called the Sotrantika school, then the mind only school, which is probably a lot of people know about that one very famous, called Yogachara or Chitta Mantra, and finally the middle way school. Uh, the Madhyamika school, which they further divide into what they call the autonomous existence, autonomous syllogism schools, well, the Svotantrika, and the Prasangika or middle way consequential school, which is the one as Glupas that we study, the one that is necessary for a uh, proper uh, understanding of emptiness, more in a tantric context for your Vajrayana teachings and uh, practice. So anyway, each one of these four schools has a different understanding of the object to be negated when you're realizing emptiness, right? So we'll get into that sort of in later classes, but that's kind of interesting. But on the whole, like I said, self-existence, we can just write off the bat very superficial definition and say self-existence is that which uh, is the object of negation. But what self-existence means, means different things for these four schools. Right. So and, and it gets very, very subtle. It, anyway, it's really, really beautiful. Each one preserves the previous understanding a little bit, which is interesting. So it's like um, like a raga or a fugue where it's sort of an inner art, like, you know, sort of the classical Indian or classical Western uh, music where there is sort of an inner articulation of the music as it moves on and it deepens and gets more complex. Okay, um, so we need to know this before we study emptiness because we have to know what something is empty of. So um, a truly existent thing, if there was such a thing, if it did exist, it would have to exist in opposite way to which we uh, things conventionally or deceptively exist. But you see things this way. Okay, so in other words, it's in other words, when you have anger, desire, um, you can't have a negative emotion unless you're focused on self-existence. Okay. Therefore, you can mean our hat when you realize that there isn't any self-existent thing. Okay, so that's my notes written here is basically, of course, when we talk about uh, truly existent existence or impossible existence, existence that's unrelated to everything. So in other words, it's object of negation. Of course, in a Buddhist seminar, we're doing class like this. We're all sitting around a table or at the temple. We're like, uh -huh, yeah, of course, you know what that is. Yeah, of course, oh, we, there's never been any self-existent thing. We, everything's dependent arising. Everything's interrelated, the web of life. You know, we're all one. Everything is one. We all say this kind of thing. But, you know, the moment you leave the temple and go out in the parking lot or you know head down to 7-eleven or something like that or starbucks all of a sudden it's like oh, you're back in samsara and you know upset or having issues or fighting with people or in your mind it's like super super negative and the point is is that those negative emotions those negative behaviors those bad habits all revolve around almost like gravity turn around this deep deep ignorance we have in our minds that is the ignorance of always positing this inherent or impossible existence. So every time you get angry, every time you have desirous attachment, every time you have a judgmental mind, or ignorance, uh, or uh, you know, sort of spaced out numb mind, whatever you wanna say, all of these are predicated on a grasping or understand, uh, sort of an ignorant positing of inherent existence. Right. So, you know, can, we've talked about conventional existence or uh, existence being deceptive. Things are just a product of our mind. They look independent of our mind. They look dualistically. 
uh, present to us, but deep down when we study emptiness, we, we know that they're not. Um, things, of course, are just a product of, of our mind. That's why we call them conventional existence. But from an ignorant point of view, they don't look like that in the sense that we don't have that understanding. Intellectually, we can say we do, but in our day-to-day -day behavior, we think that things are completely unrelated to us. And so in opposition to us, a threat to us or whatever else, you know, we, in our minds, you know, intellectually, we can say, oh, we understand the emptiness, things are just a product of my mind, things are just my mind, let it go, everything changes, Mahamudra, blah, blah, blah. But on a day-to-day -day basis, watch your mind. I know mine's pretty negative a lot of the time. So watch your mind and just see all the little stories and soap operas we have turning in our head where we're getting angry at stuff or getting attached to things or wondering or being super judgmental where we're judging people all the time, judging events. Um, we don't see that that is just a, a mental process, a product of our mind. We don't see that the things are just conventionally imputed. We think that they're absolutely, truly, existently real. And that's why we can get angry and want to sort of destroy them, so to speak, that we can get so attached and need to possess something at all costs. Why we can be super judgmental and think that our judgments aren't just our judgments, just our opinions, you know, just my opinion, man, but rather substantial qualities of the outside world so to speak you know in other words i don't like that guy at work the guy's a jerk whatever he's an inherently existing jerk of course he's a jerk you know everyone knows he's a jerk he's a jerk 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 so doesn't matter that his dog loves him doesn't matter that his mom loves him in other words other people don't see him as a jerk so he's not inherently existing or, or a self-existing jerk but in my mind he is i mean we can see this everybody kind of knows this but you can see that the, the of course emptiness only has in this case a therapeutic use like what we're really doing is is using these teachings not as some sort of philosophy class where we're just arguing ontology or something but this is like a medicine to correct your suffering right so in our hat or a photo story we've talked about before of course is once they have perceived emptiness and a stable realized emptiness have defeated with all their foes or their enemies the sort of war that's going on in their mind, the war that's going on in their heart. Now there is peace because the war was started by their own ignorance of grasping at self-existence, right? Okay, um, just to sort of finish up here, five arguments for emptiness. Um, so there's you know, there's a lot of different ways of sort of presenting empty sort of arguments for. So. Um, the general thing is that if something was self-existent or impossibly existent, as we say, it would have to be self-existently single or many. So it'd have to be one or many if this was the case. Um, so uh, now when we start actually looking at what things are like, when we see that, you know, we start looking at the one and the many, these things alone, as you can see, are interrelated. You don't have one without many. You don't have many without one. So already that's an argument for emptiness it's showing relationships which self-existence the whole point of grasping onto self-existence is saying that something doesn't have a relationship to anything else especially our mind okay so already even when you're looking at these arguments for emptiness they're getting very very clear that things are interdependent and so they lack inherent existence uh, I know I got here, emptiness is like a diamond, it's a pure substance, every piece chart of a diamond is a pure diamond as well. Of course, I really recommend get you Michael Roach's diamond cutter book, he's done all those teachings, he was a diamond salesman, this and that, you can see, that's really good, and he always said that that's the reason they use in Buddhist teachings diamond as an example of emptiness so the, a really good analogy is sort of an absolute pure thing the purest substance uh carbon bonded to itself as molecules uh it's the hardest most perfect substance only a diamond could kind of diamond so only wisdom realizing emptiness uh understands emptiness and cuts like a diamond can cut through anything can cut through your ignorance which is you know your grasping and inherent existence is the hardest delusion or hardest suffering to get rid of, a diamond cuts right through that. That's your wisdom realizing emptiness. Also, a diamond is, um, which I didn't know until I read that book, is invisible. You only see a diamond if it has flaws, if there's actually other things in the carbon, I guess, bonds or it's bonded to something else. But a pure diamond, an absolute 100% pure diamond, doesn't reflect light. It's so perfect. So it's completely transparent. 
just like emptiness. Emptiness is ultimate reality. You only see conventional things. We don't see emptiness, which is their absent, the lack of inherent existence, right? Their lack of self-existence, which is a negation. So it's invisible. So emptiness is everywhere around you. Your mind's empty, everything, and yet we don't see it. It's literally right under your nose, just like a pure diamond. I think that's really cool. So it's all that's basically when they say enlightenment is right under your nose. That's what they're talking about, right? The medicine uh, for all your sufferings, your ability to become a divine being is in the nature of yourself, the nature of your mind, your very being the nature of things all around you, which is the fact that they don't have a nature, right? So they're completely uh, flexible, completely plastic and transformable. So we can make the cell chemical change from uh, lead into gold, from samsara into a Buddha universe, you know, from along the tantric path by perceiving emptiness. So the thing, it's, uh, proofs for emptiness. Number one, things can't arise from themselves. Two, things can't arise from something else. Three, uh, they can't arise from something else uh, or themselves. Or four, they can't arise without a cause. Okay. Uh, so these reasons uh, treat all changing things or all permanent things uh, with causes, mental or physical. So, um, but you can see what's interesting. So number one is like uh, multiple things uh, do not come from multiple causes. Single results uh, are, are denied, do not come from multiple causes. Multiple results do not come from single causes. You can do all the different permutations of this, right? And things aren't uh, self-existent because they're interdependent and dependent upon other things. So basically when you use these four, the, the five, uh, the, the fifth reason our argument for emptiness basically is dependent origination, which is they call the king of reasonings. In other words, everything is interdependent or dependently uh, its origin is dependent on, on other things, right? You know, a seed turns into a plant because it needs soil, it needs sunlight, it needs nutrients, it needs um, water, all these things. So anything that is has to depend on other things, right? Other things have to depend on it. So everything is interrelated in a web of life for that analogy they use, sort of the net of Indra, where net of God, king of the gods, Hindu gods throws all the diamonds out on this plane and all the diamonds reflect all the other ones. It's like everything, all the different universes, all the different things in the universe are all interdependent, so reflect one another. So this is the king of reasons because it, it's the best argument for emptiness. And uh, it's the easiest way to study emptiness. So, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh's amazing book, um, I think it's Heart of Wisdom or something on the Heart Sutra, shows us the famous one I read a lot where he says you know, in the first page of the book, in this page, do you see a cloud? Uh, well, without the cloud, you don't get rain. Without the rain, you don't get uh, trees. Without trees, you don't get wood. Without wood, you don't get paper. Without paper, you don't get the book that you're reading right now. So all these things are in, um, in the, the page of the book. Uh, so everything is, in, and you can do that with basically anything. You know, everything is interdependent in a causal network. Um, so anyway, there, there's, we'll, we'll come back to this a, a little bit in the future, but um, again, so if, again, the four first reasons are things can't arise from itself, two, can't arise from something else, three, can't arise from self and something else, four, can't arise without a cause, okay? So everything has to have a cause, everything has to be produced. You can't have unproduced things because an unproduced thing would basically be something outside of a causal or interrelated relationship. So that, you know, Aristotle says the same thing that everything has causes, you know, be that material cause, formal, efficient, and final cause. This is another discussion here uh, that we could have in the future because uh, there's some good arguments for emptiness even in Aristotle, you could say. But basically, those four arguments end up going into the fifth argument, which is the best argument, which is the ar argument for uh, interdependent origination, dependent origination, the king of reasons. What you see is if something can arise from something else uh, or can arise from itself or both or everything else, you're ending up making these arguments for dependent origination right there, right? That everything 
happens because it's related to everything else. And so we, you know, we talk in, in, when you're talking about, uh, you know, Buddhist logic and so forth, we always talk about substantial causes and circumstantial causes, right? Or secondary causes, you know, substantial cause of a, of a plant is seed, but you don't get the plant without the circumstantial causes of all those other things like uh, sunlight, soil, nutrients, uh, water, you know, maybe a gardener or whatever, those things all come together and then you get uh, the, the plant grows because of that. Take any of those things out and then something's not produced, right? So anyway, there we go. Let's, uh, let's sort of end on that spot uh, right here and we'll come back to uh, five ways to prove emptiness again uh, next. We'll just sort of continue the conversation a little bit next uh, Saturday. Uh, and that this is sort of the last part of uh, the class here, uh, of this particular module. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. I, I hate sort of rushing things. This was a, sort of a shorter class, but I just uh, been very, very busy. And so next week I make up for have a normal, uh, uh, normal uh, run, run time, so to speak, of the class. Okay, so let's just take a moment just to dedicate this. Uh, if anything, just any, they say just meditating emptiness a little bit or studying it causes the whole building of samsara to sort of shake, you know, like it's going to fall down in an earthquake. So any little bit of emptiness we study is really sort of the medicine for all of our ills, of medicine for our mind. All the sort of uh, that great uh, Theravada saint, uh, Deepa Ma, we said the mind is just stories. I've actually seen that quote everywhere now, but when I read that years ago, I was really impressed. But the mind is just stories, you know, it's just a stream of uh, events for the most part. And so what those stories, they're all causally driven like anything else. And, uh, you know, they can be good stories or bad stories, but you see how so much of the time you're just constantly stuck in your own head, talking to yourself, going over things, judging this sort of loop, usually of negativity in your mind. And so emptiness is the medicine for that, to see that it is just your mind. None of these things are self-existent. They're just products of karma. And so they're impermanent. They change. They don't have to be that way. They can be different and they go away on their own. So all this is a medicine for, for our suffering. So let's, uh, again, let's dedicate this uh, for our study of emptiness. May we constantly study emptiness and uh, study it and study it and study it and learn more and more and more about it, share it with others, and eventually have a direct experience, a yogic direct perceiver of this and reach for awakening. So by the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, power of a pure spirit intention, may all of our dharma wishes be fulfilled, and all sentient beings get enlightened. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.